situation were going to be experienced on a much, much wider scale by people who really live at the, at the base. Um, so let's just take a look at the Millennium Development Goals. They are eight in number. And as, as we reflect on the goals, it's good to remember what Thomas Berry said about, about both us as a human community and the natural world. It's one sacred community to which we belong. And we can't tend to the human without in some way impacting the natural world. So the first goal is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Also included in that goal is to work for full and productive <coughs> employment for all people. The International Labor Organization just recently uh, produced a study indicating that one in three workers worldwide, or more than one billion people, we're either unemployed or living in poverty. So if there's no work, there are no resources available for people to access even meager supplies. Youth are especially hard hit and are three times more likely to be unemployed than adults. And at this point worldwide, nearly 75 million young people are without work. And if you look at what has been happening in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, a lot of that unrest is sown by the discontent of young people and inability uh, to do what they feel they need to do to secure health and happiness in their own lives. Poverty has put a tremendous and sometimes unbearable pressure on families. When food and funds are scarce, patience and understanding are strained. Suicide, drug abuse, and violence against women and children are more likely to incur in impoverished areas. So we see an escalation of suicide, drug abuse, violence against <coughs> women and children, not only in other parts of the world, but right in our own backyard, in neighborhoods that are extremely impoverished. The second goal, to achieve universal primary education. At present, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia have the highest percentages of children not attending school. But we know that education is key in terms of public health efforts and poverty reduction. Job prospects and income levels rise. Maternal and child health improves where education is happening. So there's a push to achieve universal primary education. And of course, you know, it's less problematic for boys than it is for girls. To promote gender equality and to empower women. Girls between the age of five and 14 assume greater and greater household and caregiving roles. Disproportionate numbers of girls are taken out of school early because they're needed as caregivers, especially for those suffering from HIV AIDS. Violence against women and girls, especially in areas like the Congo, rape is used as a weapon of war, a way to destroy the foundation of communities. So frequently girls are kept home out of fear for sending them to school knowing the risks that are involved. And uh, I was in May, uh, in Africa last May, in Kenya, at a meeting of Dominican sisters. The sisters from Nigeria were building a school on their property. And they had half the school done. They were get, having a hard time construct the sec, constructing the second part, which would have been a residence, because they don't want the girls to travel back and forth, because it's putting girls at risk. So on the one hand, we want to promote gender equality and empower women, but there, there's an awful lot that stands in the way of that. Um, another <coughs> book I would recommend to you, if you're not familiar with it, is Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof and his wife, Cheryl Wu Dun. The title is taken from a Chinese proverb, Women Hold Up Half the Sky. And Nicholas Kristof and his wife have traveled the globe lifting up the situation of women and girls. It's, it's an inspiring book to read. It's a difficult book to read. But it gives you a very 
good glimpse at what women and girls experience globally and how many of them are able to survive the horrific events that transpire in their lives to do great things for the benefit of other women and girls. The fourth goal, to reduce child mortality. I, on a previous slide, it was mentioned that um, one out of five children dies before his or her fifth birthday. If the trend of malnutrition isn't caught by the time a child reaches the age of five, generally the child is um, irreparably damaged, physically, emotionally, developmentally. So to, to reduce child mortality from lack of food, from diseases, that in this country, are, are, we would just never imagine a children dying of, of malaria in this country, or something as simple as diarrhea or pneumonia. Pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, AIDS account for 43% of children's deaths in the developing world. Approximately 9 million children die each year before reaching the age of 5. And the highest rates are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. And of course, intimately connected with the child's health is frequently the mother's health. If the mother is malnourished, then the child is born compromised and has very little chance of surviving and living a healthy life. More than 350,000 women die annually from complications in pregnancy or childbirth. And 99% of these women are from the developing world. Most maternal deaths could be avoided. The greatest risk areas, once again, are Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia, where most women go through pregnancy and childbirth without the benefit of sterile conditions and skilled care. Poverty and lack of education continue to perpetuate high adolescent birth rates. So the more education there is, the less likely it becomes for younger girls to become pregnant. So education is critical, it's key. And again, in uh, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu Dunn's book, uh, they do a wonderful job lifting up the issue of maternal health. The sixth goal, to combat HIV AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Of course, the hope was that there would be a, a drastic reversal in AIDS by now. In some respects, that has happened. But despite attempts at universal access to treatment, new infections keep far ahead of the numbers of cases that are able to be treated. Malaria, the estimate is a child dies of malaria every 45 seconds. Malaria is preventable, malaria is curable. One of the easiest ways to prevent malaria is a mosquito net. And I, I tell groups that there's a great program you can Google Nothing but nets. Uh, a writer from Sports Illustrated took a trip to Africa, saw what was happening to the population, especially children, in terms of malaria. Came back and initiated this campaign, Nothing but nets. A mosquito net costs $10. Groups of students sometimes get together, they'll have a basketball game or whatever, and the proceeds they will send to Nothing but nets. If you're working with young people, it's a great way to raise their consciousness about this global phenomena and give them the, the, the sense that they can do something concrete to help eliminate it. But this kind of thing is inexcusable in the world in which we live today. Another um, phenomena is that of non-communicable diseases in the developing world. It's considered a slow motion disaster. Unhealthy food, you know, in this country we're fighting obesity. So a lot of companies are transporting their food to the developing world where people will eat anything. If you're hungry, you'll eat anything. But it's wreaking havoc on populations abroad. Tobacco is more easily accessible in the developing world. So what we're, we're not using here, because companies are having a harder and harder time marketing it, they're shipping overseas. So the cancer rates are increasing because of tobacco. Cancer rates are also increasing because of the fallout from toxic waste from mines and construction projects that are the responsibility of multinational corporations. 
So non-communicable diseases are on the uprise in the developing world. The seventh goal has to do with our environment and sustainability. The hope was to reduce biodiversity loss, but we've missed that target. The number of species facing extinction continues to grow, especially in the developing world, as their habitats become compromised through industry. And the hope was also by 2015 to make sure that that the vast majority of the world's people had access to clean drinking water and proper sanitation. A lot of what has happened environmentally in our world is a direct consequence of the way we have done development. Now, the Industrial Revolution in this country did great things for us. But we operate the same way, where our base is basically fossil fuel. And because it worked so well for us, China wants to do the same thing. India wants to do the same thing. And they're considered emerging economies. So what, they look at us and they say, well, if it worked for you, why can't we do it? The problem is, we live on a planet with limits. There are limits in terms of clean air as a result of carbon, emission, carbon dioxide emissions. Now, Back in 1992, you may remember the Earth Summit held in Rio de Janeiro. And in 1992, um, the nations of the world gathered in Rio, and there was a recognition that we had reached a tipping point. We were getting to the point where we were really uh, making a significant dent, negative dent, in the balance of Earth and her ecosystems. So there was great excitement and great willingness on the part of the member states to, to come together, a recognition that the best way to maintain the health of the planet would be to develop a global partnership. So they crafted agreements. They crafted the Rio principles. They crafted Agenda 21. And there was some marvelous material, marvelous words on paper indicating a level of commitment to make adaptations, to change because there was a growing recognition that the planet had limits. And what drove Rio in 1992 was this notion that human beings are at the center of concern for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. We cannot have a healthy and productive life if we're out of sync with Earth and her limits. This June, there's a gathering in Rio, and it's called Rio Plus 20. And I, I've asked the other two groups, have any of you heard about this meeting? Um, my suggestion is you Google it, or there's a website there, UNCSD 2012, United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development 2012.org, or just Google Rio Plus 20. It's an opportunity to evaluate where we've come since 1992. And the sad truth is that the world, the Earth, the planet, is in a far worse and precarious state now than it was in 1992. And at the end of the day, at this summit in Rio, there's nothing more that we can say. It's, it's simply a question of, look at all we have already said, and why haven't we done anything? Why haven't we done anything? It's lack of attentiveness to common good. It's lack of political will. It's my national self-interest that trumps what's good for the rest of the planet. That's it in a nutshell. The hope is that the gathering in Rio will be a gathering of high-level representation from member states, not just some low-level government rep. We don't know yet whether President Obama is going. But I've said this in the other two groups I've spoken with today. You might want to go home and email the president and let him know that you feel it's vitally important that he represents us at the conference in Rio. The United States is my country, and it has done many wonderful things. But it's also one of the greatest obstacles 
to this notion of sustainable development. Sustainable development means I do development in such a way that I tend to the needs of people and I respect the limits of planet Earth. There's no two ways about it. Sustainable development factors in the fact that we're not the only act in town. There are generations that are going to come after us and they deserve the right to enjoy a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. So what actions are we willing to take? What questions are we willing to ask to push the envelope in terms of the way our own country does business? Or do we have so much invested in the way things are that it's, it's easier to just stay quiet? That's a really tough thing to grapple with because we've all enjoyed marvelous benefits in terms of the way we've done development, but it can't continue. The eighth Millennium Development Goal deals with this notion of global partnerships, that the developed world would do what it could do to help the developing nations, while the developing nations would do whatever they needed to do to kind of get their acts together. And the hope, of course, would be that there would be open trade and financial system, which we know does not exist. That the uh, needs of least developed countries would be tended to. Now, one of the needs of least developed countries today, especially small island nations, has to do with their own national sovereignty. So that's a whole other layer that wasn't existed, existing in the year 2000. The notion of debt relief, there's never been a mechanism instituted to really tend to uh, the phenomena of debt in the developing world. Um, the, the need for decent and productive work for youth and uh, easier access to drugs and medication. Now the Millennium Development Goals deal with the, the notion of you know, the, the global scene in other countries, but we're not immune to the phenomena of poverty and injustice right here. It was a PBS uh, special about a year ago, maybe last fall, on uh, poverty in America. And in that special, we were told that uh, there's a 15.1% poverty rate here in the States. 46.2 million people in poverty, up from 43.6 million in 2009. So poverty is not just a foreign reality. It's right here as well. And the same forces that perpetuate poverty globally are operative right here in our own backyards. Just a reminder of the, the three overarching themes in terms of the, the Dominican agenda. And a reminder about Catholic social teaching. I'm, I'm assuming that you have a working knowledge of Catholic social teaching. For people like myself, for Catholic NGOs at the United Nations, the gospel and Catholic social teaching and the inspiration of our Dominican brothers, Las Casas and Montesinos, those are, two, those are the, issue, the um, elements that really give us impetus. Um, Catholic social teaching, I'm sure you've heard it said that it's the church's best kept secret. Because it pushes us into the structural realm. And it's much easier for the church to be involved in the work of charity than it is to be involved in the work of justice. And it might be because the church has too much invested in the way things are. But this challenges us to be about the work, the, the, the real aestheticism of working to change the structures. Nelson Mandela has a great quote like, slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It's a human creation and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict, every economic decision has a moral consequence. Said to the, the class this afternoon, um, whenever we go into a store, you know, if you have a choice between fair trade chocolate and Hershey chocolate, what are you going to buy? Your choice, your economic decision there has a moral consequence. If you buy fair trade, you're, you're really advocating for just wages, getting rid of the middlemen. Um, if you buy Hershey, you're supporting big business, multinational corporations. So th this notion of economic decisions and moral consequence, I, I'm going to suggest that there are three structural dimensions that have created and perpetuate uh, the, the, the poverty and inequity that exists in our world today. 
And it's these three structural elements that also have a, a terribly negative impact upon the health of the planet. Um, the way we do development, profit-centered development, equates progress only with economic growth, pays no attention to the quality of human life or to the limits of the planet. The current global financial architecture, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, they were established by the developing, the developed nations. They continue to be controlled by the developed nations. The whole global financial structure, there's a lack of regulation, which threw us into the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And lastly, global military spending. The disproportionate amount of resources poured into military budgets, the refinement of weapons, and training for war. So let's just take a, a quick look at the notion of military spending and remind ourselves what has been said in our own Catholic tradition about it. Vatican II, the fathers in Vatican II said, the arms race is an utterly treacherous trap for humanity and one which ensnares the poor to an intolerable degree. That was back in the early 60s. Pope Paul VI, and Popolorum Progressio said, when we combat misery and struggle against injustice, we're providing not only for humanity's prosperity, but also for humanity's spiritual and moral development. Peace is not just about eliminating war. Peace is achieved by constant effort, day after day. Provided that order is kept in sight, which was established by God, and which demands a more perfect form of justice among men and women. So what Paul is basically saying is that the things that tend, the things that make for peace have to do with tending to people. And he suggested at that time that global military budgets, a portion of global military budgets be channeled into a global military, a global development fund and it was never done. But could you, could you imagine, the world might just be a little bit different today if his words had been heeded. And his very wise statement that development is the new name for peace. Making sure that people have access to what they need to live quality human life now, that's what makes for peace. However, that's not the reality in our world today. We live in a world that the War on terrorism has given a, a, a whole new reason for developing uh, new kinds of weapons, refining the weapons that we already have. And the United States owns pride of place in having the lion's share of the global military uh, budget. I actually think we're down to 41%. But still, that's a, that's a tremendous amount of money, technology, research and development that's poured into weapons of war. And at the end of the day, are we really any safer for it when we see unrest circulating globally because people don't have what they need? Governments need to begin to recognize that excessive military budgets not only render all of us less secure, but they hold hostage an important set of resources that could be contributing to the eradication of poverty worldwide and a much more secure and peaceful world for all of us. Militarism and the economic framework that supports it are probably the world's largest barriers to ending poverty. They destroy communities, waste resources, pollute the air and water, prevent sustainable development, and siphon off resources that could be put at the service of human need and the cause of a genuine and lasting peace. The cost of two B-52 bombers is $4.4 billion. And the annual cost, the annual budget for the World Food Program is $3.2 billion. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, no matter how you cut it. In 2009, in the midst of the financial and economic crisis, global military expenditures rose to $1,536 billion. 
aid, development aid from donor nations was 126 billion. During that time, donor nations pulled back because they said they took a financial hit in the crisis. But military budgets continued to rise. Military budgets continued to rise. Just a, a, a tiny peek at how the federal government spends income tax dollars. This is from 2010. 39% was used to fund current wars, past wars, to take care of the nuclear budget, military-related programs, veterans affairs, nuclear weapons. Drop down to the bottom, it says 2%. Diplomacy, development, war prevention, the entire State Department support for the United Nations. So the proportion of monetary resources that are poured into the things that make for peace is pitiful compared to the amount of resources that are poured into we weapons of mass destruction and training for war. Training for war. Martin Luther King has said that a nation, a nation that continues year after year to spend more on military defense than on progress, programs of social uplift, is approaching spiritual death. And I think we can add in there more that on military defense than on programs of social uplift and care of earth. Care of earth. Because that is much more an issue today than it has been at any other point in time. Whenever I hear John's gospel that come that they may have life and have it to the full, what, what does that mean? What does it mean? Does it mean in just some faraway place? I don't think so. You know, if, if we can enter into the solidarity that John Paul II calls us to, then I think we're spurred on to do whatever we're able to do so that people can enjoy some of that fullness of life now. And the Second Vatican Council has that beautiful um, uh, sentence that it's the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are in poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the followers of Christ. The joys and hopes, griefs, and anxieties of people of all faith traditions, all faith traditions, invite us and challenge us deeply to be about the business of loving others as ourselves across the board. So we're full circle back to Montesinos. With what right? And uh, I want to end by referring to a book, The Silent Cry, uh, Mysticism and Resistance, by the late German liberation theologian Dorothy Soleil. And in her book, she writes a little bit about Cesar Chavez. I, I think most of us probably don't remember Cesar Chavez. Uh, he was, uh, along with Dolores Huerta, established the United Farm Workers Union. In the summer of 1988, Cesar Chavez maintained a fast for life that lasted for 36 days in protest against the pesticide poisoning of vineyard workers and their children. At that time, he said, if you are outraged about existing conditions, you cannot be free or happy until you give all your time to change them and do nothing else but that if you are outraged. So my feeling is it's in that spirit that we need to ask ourselves difficult questions. Are we outraged about the conditions in our world today? And if not, why not? If we are, what actions are we willing to take? What questions are we willing to ask? Or do we have so much invested in the way things are that silence and inaction become the better course for us? This notion of a, a biblically inspired option for the poor has two key elements. Solidarity, which means I do whatever I can to enter into the reality of those who are marginalized. The other aspect has been termed a political aspect. 
It begins with discerning and analyzing a situation, which should ultimately lead us to a fundamental choice to ensure that we are not consciously or unconsciously colluding in the injustice. Perhaps the story of Bartolome de las Casas offers us an insight in this regard. His own status as a gentleman cleric was deeply challenged by the preaching of Antonio Montesinos. While it took 